the theological turn in phenomenology um, really began through the course of the 20th century with thinkers like uh, Paul Ricoeur, uh, Emmanuel Levinas, Michel Henry, um, uh, even Maurice Merleau-Ponty to some some extent, and certainly continues on with uh, with those figures' disciples, Edith Stein, we can't forget, um, and into the 21st century, I think the theological turn remains strong and convincing, and there's uh, many scholars working at the frontiers of this intersection of phenomenology and theology today, and I believe bearing uh, much fruit that's helpful not only uh, in intellectual pursuits and theoretical pursuits in and of themselves, but also for pastoral ministry as well. Um, when you have that beautiful um, wedding between theory and praxis, uh, that happens uh, in the course of ministry, in the course of real life, family life, friendships, uh, encounter with the stranger, encounter with the other, any other. Uh, I believe that the theological turn itself signifies um, the, the great value placed on mystery revealed in the person. Uh, the person who faces me, who I will never get to the bottom of, never finish knowing, who will never finish revealing himself to me, even into eternity. And so I think our encounter with the personal other is always a theological event, a theological phenomenon. And if we reduce that encounter to anything less than that, uh, we are not, you know, speaking the fullness of truth, we do an injustice uh, to the other person, and ultimately we conflate the other person to an object, to a means, to an end, um, etc. Uh, so, altogether, I think that the theological turn uh, signifies um, the ultimate possibilities in humanism, in our ethical relationships, uh, one person to another. Let us start by uh, a very quick definition of saturated phenomenon. Saturated phenomenon is very widely spread uh, uh, by contrast to the common law phenomenon or the object. The object, the object is a very special case of a phenomenon because it is a phenomenon where we have a concept of it which is able to explain all the intuition we have with that concept. Uh, for instance, uh, when you, you, you use a, you say that, a camera, a camera to shoot uh, something, uh, the camera is a common law phenomenon. That is, the one who can use it knows exactly how it works, uh, what should be uh, checked, uh, how to repair it, how to uh, to uh, to uh, regulate it, and so on. So, if it is a well-built camera, uh, there will be no surprise. Everything is already uh, uh, in the concept of it, and all the technical objects and all the objects of common use are precisely a case of equality between what we experience by intuition when using or knowing them and the concept we have. We have a concept, we have the concept protects us, so to speak, against any surprise. But there are, in the daily life, many other concept, uh, phenomena where our concept remains partial, cannot explain uh, everything we could experience with that phenomenon. And uh, uh, the phenomenon can surprise us. It is not that because it is an object can be very, the concept of an object can be very complex, but it is always adequate to what is going on with that object. In a certain phenomenon, you have always the possibility, in fact it is in fact certain, to have a surplus 
of understandable, at least at the beginning, of intuition compared to what was uh, foreseen by the concept. I think that part of the reason we human beings get so excited about um, traveling, about um, going out at night and rendezvous with uh, whoever, uh, a gathering, a meal, is because of the unpredictability. Say the NBA playoffs, um, things like this. Even though we've seen some things hundreds of times, uh, we give ourselves over to a new event, uh, you know, enjoying the art of surprise. And so I think that itself is phenomenology. Uh, what uh, keeps us going every day, you know, looking for another message of good news, uh, of goodness that will give itself to us, that will reveal itself to us, looking for another very meaningful, ethical, interpersonal encounter, um, ultimately looking for the experience of love. And uh, I like to observe my own children at play. I like to observe my own children going about the day. Um, we live near some woods and a river and uh, especially some of my younger boys love to find various reptiles and uh, amphibians and even I talk to them they know I study phenomenology and I, and I say be a good phenomenologist don't say you won't find anything today you never know. And when we go out in nature, for example, that's the beauty of exploring nature is we never know what we're going to encounter. We never know what we're going to find. Uh, even earlier today on campus, I was walking across a little bridge with a little pond, and to my left, I saw a beautiful mallard, a male mallard with you know the green shining head, and I was just struck by this, this beautiful creature, this duck. And uh, then to my right, I saw a turtle in the pond and I wondered what kind of turtle is this oh my my boys would love to be here right now and see this turtle and maybe try to catch it and look at it closer and then further up in the pond I saw a mother mallard with uh, all of her little ducklings and they were eating at the grass and I said oh, isn't this majestic isn't this wonderful and then I proceeded into the cafeteria and people there are getting their food and I had to go for some Indian cuisine. It's like my favorite kind of food. And I got the buttered chicken and a couple different kinds of vegetables, zucchini and cabbage and rice. And it was a feast. Again, it wasn't just about filling my belly, but it was about taking in all of the, the wonder and the beauty and the goodness and the, the love that surrounded me in that cafeteria. Um, so I think these kind of experiences uh, can be considered saturated phenomena if we let them. And uh, so, and you cannot explain your experience of the phenomenon. And it is very simple. For instance, if you have a drink, you cannot explain why you, uh, it tastes good or bad. <laughs> that is beer, that is not my beer, I don't like that. Why? You cannot explain it. And indeed, uh, uh, the same thing for painting, same thing for, uh, for your own body, for instance. When you have pain, you feel pain somewhere, you don't know why. And it is not that easy for the doctor to, to always to, to, to find out what is the, the cause of it. That is, the, he has to do, we have to go through exams, things like that, to, to improve the concept in order to understand the pain you have already experienced, which is absolutely certain. So, I would say, the more a phenomenon means something for us, the more it appears to be a saturated phenomenon, where there is an excess of intuition compared to the concept. And so when I first uh, explained this, uh, this kind of phenomenon, some people told me, well, yes, but this is, there are exceptional uh, phenomena. 
it is for mystical experience, for art, something like that. No, it is for daily life. What means the most in daily life are saturated phenomena. And we are in fact uh, mostly dealing with saturated phenomena. But why is there a privilege of objective phenomena, non-saturated phenomena? The answer is very simple. We control them. So we build them in order to expand the field we can rule. So uh, with a cell phone, you can do now a lot of things and get many information. So it is the achievement of the object. But although we make such a wide use of the cell phone that we cannot live anymore without our cell phone, nevertheless, the cell phone will never give us surprise. Unless we are called on our cell phone by a saturated phenomenon, that is the other, the significant other. So, in fact, the cell phone is so important because it is a connection to saturated phenomena, that is, the people we are in touch with. So, with this concept, which is, after all, is a very a straightforward and simple concept to understand the saturated phenomenon. From that moment on, it, you can speak about art, about the erotic phenomenon, about food and drink, <laughs> about pain and pleasure, about health, death, birth, and obviously, you may use that to uh, understand what is going on in, uh, uh, in the Bible or in uh, the Christian experience. Because uh, religious phenomena are the privileged case of saturated phenomena. And I try to, to, to develop that. <laughs>